Okay, so good to see you and looking good and everything. Thanks a lot hey. for coming and talking to ACAP. I really cool. appreciate that. And in the audience, welcome very, very much to Conversations. A pleasure to welcome to the program a genuine, as they say, uh, intellectual. Uh, his name is Stuart Mason Dambrod, and he has he is a conciliatist. Is that right? He's a conciliatist. So that would be speak to many people in the audience with uh, Edward Wilson and so forth. But he's also a comprehensivist and interested in a wide range of, uh, of, of interesting things affecting and being relevant to the human condition in a very, very interesting and enlightened way. And Stuart, welcome so much to Conversation. Really happy to welcome you. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's great to see you again. Yeah, and, it's uh, good to see you again. We saw you, you dressed ACAP, for which I thank you very much. It's up on pleasure. YouTube, we could mention. They could use your name and search YouTube. The three hours that you spoke with some of the people that the Association of Cable Access produces, again, I thank you for that. It's my pleasure. And also also for David Sotnik for introducing us, a mutual friend. And Stuart, do me a favor now. Yes, You're really interesting. Uh, you've really got a wide-ranging uh, intellectual interest. But could you share, just to wade in, as it were, where you were born and raised, some of your education, of and how you came to be uh, interested in the thing, uh, the thing, the many things in systems thinking that you 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 developed? And then we want to let them know about your blog and so forth. Born and raised, a little of that, please. Surely. Mm. Um, Native New Yorker. Mm -hmm. um, when I was very young, we lived up on Seaman Avenue, okay. all the way up near the Oh, Clusters. I know. It's beautiful. Yeah. 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 There were times back then when it wasn't quite as nice, a little dangerous now and then. You got that Indian Indian settlement down at the end of Seaman's on the river. Where there were people there. It was really beautiful. This, in was, this was a long time ago, though, because when I was very young. Oh, I see. Yeah. I was very, very young. And then we moved to Washington, D.C. My father was in the Air Force uh -huh. um, uh, as a medical officer and then right. we came back to the city. Hmm. Um, uh, but, but that was yeah. a site of early Indian settlement right there at the uh, where the river, the Harlem River and the Hudson meet. It was a big Indian settlement there. But anyway, that yeah. I happen to know that. I used to go up there you and know, visit with the well, doctor. You know a lot. That's one of the well, I happen to yeah. know yeah. Siemens, yeah. <laughs> and it's really 215, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah we were at 110 Seaman Avenue all the way up the left. Well, all right, yeah. good. Yeah, it's good. You're near, you're near the park there, too. You got a yes, lot that's of, right. You right could be park. out in the country there. It's really a, a good part of Manhattan. It yeah. was a nice park. I remember yeah. it very well. So you were raised there, and then uh, how but old were you? Only about when you very young, two or three. Oh, oh, oh! I see. Well, you won't remember <laughs> yeah. that too well. But you then went to Washington with your Washington, dad. Washington D.C. Yeah. Uh huh. And he was in the military. Yeah, he was in the Air Force. He was an officer. Yeah, medical officer. Medical officer in, in the right. Air Force. And so it started. Uh, you know, to your question, mm. um, I remember you know being very young. I mean, um, where he would read uh, science. Uh, and various, you know, books that I couldn't understand, but I believe right. that he laid the groundwork yeah. as my brain was developing. Right, right. Uh, And I remember he took me, when I was quite young, uh, to the Air Force Base and took me on a jet. Uh -huh. well, and that, that was one of the things that really clicked, clicked yeah. in for me. I'll bet. You know, yeah. uh, the beautiful design, the technology, and, yes. and so on. Uh, just a lot more of those experiences. Uh, it was intellectually rich, the environment in which you were raised in the home? I would say. Yeah, okay, yeah, good. I, would say, yeah. I think yeah. it's important, don't you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I do. Right, yeah, yes, right. I do. And your uh, mother, was she intellectually? Uh, she was uh, very bright. She, uh, she was, she could have done a lot of things. She right. chose to, as many women did in those days, yeah. for better or worse. Uh, she was a housewife and mother. Mm -hmm, right. uh, I kept trying to get her to be a research librarian mm -hmm. or something, but. Yeah, when she, you were older. Yeah, a little bit older, yeah. Even yeah. when I was younger, though, I, I thought that she might be happier doing something with her mind, which which was and still is, you uh -huh. know, substantial. You can do a lot nowadays with your mind if you're just right in your own home because you got That's access true. to so much. The whole world's coming to you. Yes, you don't it, have to yes, wait to go to it. But, but anyway, you went to school and so forth in Washington? and then Oh, no, no. Mm. I, I have a degree in physiological psychology. Okay. Uh, University of Connecticut. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, that was considerably later. Was that coming back to New York then? You were here? Uh, uh, well, I was back in New York, year. and um, then I... I was interested in a lot of things. I went. I was in Connecticut for a while, and uh -huh. then and lived there, uh -huh. and I, I went to school there. Mm -hmm. uh, and traveled around quite a bit. Uh -huh. a kind of a Jack Kerouac kind of uh, on the road. Uh, on the road. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh -huh. um, lived overseas and, and so on. But uh, to, uh, back to your question, it's uh, it's always been this way. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned the other night at APAC how yeah. when I was quite young, seven, I was just kind of drawing and doodling, and um, I had this idea. 
and I asked my parents about it, and uh, they really didn't understand. But I, I, I asked them if I was in a, a rocket ship, yeah, uh, traveling faster than the speed of light. And I didn't know from Einstein at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I landed on a, the moon or a planet. Yeah. Could I land, turn around, and watch my image coming since I uh -huh. went faster than the speed okay. of light? Yeah. Turns out it's a, it's a profound and interesting question, uh -huh. and there's actually an answer. What age are you at this time when you're asking that question? Seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Out of the mouths of babes. Yeah, know. kind of like that. You picked up on. Who physics. knows? Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I was watching one of the early science programs for kids. Yeah. A uh, small audience of kids in the back, um, and he had a. I remember like it was yesterday. He had a round uh, cardboard wheel in, with um, randomized black and white shapes. Okay. Um, uh -huh. And he said, "I'm going to spin this." Now, mm -hmm. the kids in the audience will see color. But you at home won't because this was black and white television yeah, still. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. I saw color. Huh. And then what I realized, in, and this is what's hard to describe, but in that moment, yeah. I knew that perception occurs uh, in a relationship between the object and the brain, and okay. that the color perception had to be in the brain because the, co the te television couldn't perceive it uh, or display it. Right. So, like in a like in a gestalt. Like in printing. Like or in a something? gestalt. Or gestalt. Yeah. I, I, right. I, I, I understood it. Yeah. And I. And you're talking seven years old now. I was eight. For that eight. One. Okay. So yeah. you're young and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there was a lot of that kind of stuff about yeah. uh -huh. uh, probabilities uh -huh. and uh, uncertainty. And, and when and you brought these things up over the dinner table, the parents would say, "Shut up." They would say, "Oh, they would examine it with they, you." No, they would they, unfortunately, you. no. They would just, uh, you know, they would just kind of, I don't know gloss over it because, uh, you know, they didn't Oh, it's really just a kid. Yeah. Something like that, yeah. It was Children, little, please be quiet. Yeah, yeah like No, that. no, no, but it was, it was a, do you have brothers and sisters? It was yeah, the family, yeah, what I'm getting sister. at, the family yeah. setting was encouraging of thinking creatively and so forth, and no, uh, I was pretty, well, so what Well, I suppose, now? I was pretty much on my own about okay. it, though. It was just, I was. I once did a program with a person who was this, by the, they have this idea of IQ, hmm. IQ, and she had the highest IQ of anyone in the history of the world as they measured these things. And she, they have a thing, Mensa, uh -huh. where they measure yeah. it, and then they have a thing, that's two percentile, and then it goes up into the 99.9 .9 percentile, yeah. there's special tests, and then there's one called Mega. And there was only eight, 28 people in the world that had passed oh the exams, God. they have to measure it at that mm. level. I once had lunch with four of them. Then there's one other society that there's one person who, uh, I guess it's been questioned now, but had such a high IQ from the age of five or something right up to adulthood, where they, it was a society of only one person, the smartest person <laughs> in the history of the world, 238, 228 IQ oh my goodness. from the youth and everything. And so she was, she was my co-host on programs for a while back. Love but to. that's IQ. Yeah. And then there's other parts of perception that are really important. That's but true. You probably, I presume, you must have uh, in your family and everything, you probably had a high IQ. Yeah, I mean, I know what, what it was back, back then. It wasn't anywhere near anything like that. No, that right. was that was unique to the whole world. There's more than John Stuart Mill or anybody, you know. That was yeah. such a high, uh, that sm it was really funny. We used to be like thing it was the smart, it was funny as a brand. It was the smartest person it's in the world. Amazing. You know? yeah, yeah, that yeah. really is quite astounding because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's it's not linear, right? Her name Thought, is, right? her name was Marilyn Mock Beau Savant. She was the granddaughter of Ernst Mach, the oh, famous okay, physicist, sure, the sure, physicist sure. in Al Austria and everything. Wonderful person and everything, and everything. seemed to know everything, but Anyway, I didn't and go to go off on that. No, no. It's you very obviously have it's a high IQ and a pattern because you're. I can been to your site and it is so rich. I'm here to tell you. Why don't we tell them how we can get in touch with you right now? Ah, we'll repeat. Very good. Very what? good. Um, I have a, now a short way of getting to the site okay. rather than that whole. Yeah, you the just whole changed list. it recently. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's even shorter than that now. Okay, it's good. just critical thought. Critical thought. Dot c o. Critical thought. Dot c o. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And that's okay. it. And that's your blog, then. Yeah, yeah, it's a blog, right. and it, I also Rich have my Rich as yeah. Croces. That blog is Thank all kinds so of things. Yeah, really. And there's other things on it too. The, you know, the clients I've done work for, the right. publications I've written for. Right. I have a portfolio page. It's mm -hmm. a portfolio um, where my samples are there. I just put up something that was just published in Physorg.com uh -huh. on mm -hmm. a lens-free chip that is used to determine uh, uh, flow and uses uh, holographic tomography. You know, so, you know, so I, I, it, there's a lot of stuff there. Right, yeah, you've been interested in things in a very comprehensive kind of way. You're yeah. a conciliist. Yes. Yeah, conci that, that is E.O. Yeah. Wilson and yeah. so forth, but it doesn't mean conciliate no, necessarily. It, it means yeah. something else. Yeah. And then you're, some of your academic, which got you into where you're interested in these very things, neurophysiology and I all these kind of very interested, esoteric though. things. 
and you're interested in the interconnection between various parts of the overall system in a very, very creative yes. way. That's, mm -hmm. and thank you, and that is the consilience. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was Consilience meaning, what's the difference? Uh, Edward Wilson describes it as the unity of knowledge. Unity of, of knowledge. knowledge. Okay, right. that's and very good. And it's based, good. he's a biologist, yeah. and he bases it also, what a lot of people think he's talking just at a philosophical lo level, mm -hmm. of a philosophy of science, mm -hmm. philosophy of knowledge. Mm -hmm. But he's actually gets into, uh, and this is why I was so happy when I found his book, is I realized this is what I had that been is thinking. That is consilience. Yeah, uh, that it's based on neuroscience for him as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. Because he sees, I'm, I think rightly so, uh -huh. that whatever is being discussed, right. whatever we say to each other, whatever we think, whatever we perceive, how we perceive it, mm -hmm. it's all mediated by, originating in, or passing through our brain. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's right. it. Right. You know. Right. Right. It, and it's kind of it sounds reductionist, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's not. Uh -huh. uh, to me, it's not reductionist because I also try to keep. Uh, cognizant of levels of scale. Levels of levels scale. Levels of scale. So, for example, this is a, can be called, say, a, a macroscopic level of scale. Okay. Uh, this, this, is the way, this is what we evolve in. Mm. You oh. know, just the world in general. Oh, world our, in general. Our I senses see, huh? are evolved to perceive uh, a, a, a certain wedge, if you will, a certain spectrum of, of light, of sound. Uh, what we see is partly related to uh, what our biological intentions are for each species based okay. on evolution. Right. But as we know, uh, you can go up and down in levels of scale. Yeah. You can go from the individual to the group, to right. the planet, to the solar system, to the galaxy, yeah. you know, to groups L. of Ron galaxies. L. Hubbard has seven and dynamics, he called. You know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with yeah, yeah. yeah. They call it an individual, family, community, national, space, Call, uh, like yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, but it also he goes the seven, other way as well. Yeah, it also yeah. goes the other way. It mm. goes from, oh, so we, if we start with our, phys our physical body. Right? Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, there's the unity of the body, but then there are, uh, there's tissues and organs. Uh, right. Then there are cells. Organelles. Are, yeah. yeah, organelles. Mm. There are molecules. Right. Uh, there's DNA. There's RNA. Uh, right. And you keep going down. Then you get to um, uh, proteins and other forms of molecular structures. And right. then there are atoms. And then right. there's... Um, structures within atoms, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's, there's quantum mechanics. Then you get into physics. Yeah, and then, yeah, and yeah. then you do. And yeah, and there's an integration between it all. Well, this is something that is actually um, a, a topic of somewhat fierce debate. Okay. Uh, for the longest time, it was held that quantum events mm -hmm. uh, do not scale to the macroscopic level, that the effects are statistically zeroed out by the time you're at a higher level of scale. Okay. Well, it turns out uh, that there's some intriguing early evidence that that may not be the case. Oh, okay. um, the one of the early ones was a couple of years ago. Uh, some uni uh, some researchers in uh, Canada, I believe, uh, determined that the there are several species of uh, this genus of what's called a cryptophyte marine uh, algae. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it uses a form, uh, we, you know, our eye, our yeah. retina, has something called uh, rhodopsin, purple okay. rhodopsin, and, okay. and that's involved with, and this occurs in a lot of uh, other visual apparatus in, in organisms. Mm -hmm. But it also is the case that uh, it take, it's used for photosynthesis in these marine algae, unlike mm -hmm. chlorophyll in plants. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out, and this has been replicated, mm -hmm. and it's, it's pretty well defined, the interpretation is what is causing the debate, yeah. that when a photon mm -hmm. enters the, ro the rhodopsin-like photosynthetic material in the cryptophyte uh, marine algae, okay. it follows several paths through different uh, photosynthetic molecules simultaneously. This is mm. known as quantum superposition. Okay. So the same particle, mm. the same photon, is in several places at once, on a pro and it's a probability uh -huh. distribution. And then it collapses. It's called uh, it's it's called collapse superposition. Mm. Then collapse to okay. one reality, uh -huh. and it always collapses to the path that leads through the molecule with the highest conversion ratio from photonic to to the form of energy the, the organism needs. The is this particular a particular kind of algae, or is it? Yeah, and they're called cryptophytes. And are, is it an ancient thing? I've been around. Oh, and they're here it, now. Is it they're widespread and it's well, uh, in unique to other algae or other processes? Uh, of, uh, all we know now is that there are several species of these crypt 
these cryptophytes, mm -hmm. and they all have evolved to use uh, this photonic uh, superposition and collapse slightly differently. Mm -hmm. So what's important about this... It isn't matched in other aspects of evolution, organic evolution? Well, there might oh, be. I'll get okay, to in okay. a second. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's really key, mm -hmm. for example, I've, I've spoken... I, I've noticed that a, a lot of um, scientists who focus on one area yeah. uh, have a very, a very, very uh, well-defined range of what's considered possible and not, or probable and not. And this is something, by the way, just as a, a little aside, that mm. Thomas, Thomas Kuhn, Kuhn spoke quite yeah, about. Yeah, scientific yeah. revolution. He yeah. started saying revolutions, mm. and he basically said that Huge. there are these two forms of science, and therefore two types of scientists. I think that's true, and I yeah. think the intellectual community could be divided and conquered into such specialization that they can't understand things in the system's way, which we really need. This is true. I agree with this completely. And, and the uh, other that's division, a way to divide right? and conquer. It, in the a way intelligent it is. Uh, process. In a way, it is. Uh, CIA uh, won't talk to CIA, FBI. Tunnel vision, all these kind of things, and they don't get they don't get comprehensive systems understanding of systems. That is And yet, true. we understand increasingly that the systems are interconnected, and they should be seen comprehensively in a pattern recognizing kind yeah, of. Yeah, I, I. This is kind of what I'm interested in. Yeah. And at the other difference that, uh, that happens is that the, for example, the, uh, I, m I mentioned it the other night, the Einsteins of the world, yeah. the paradigm changers, if mm -hmm. you will, mm -hmm. they um, bring a whole, they reset the way in which we understand our physical world. Special uh, theory of relativity, uh, uh, 1905. Uh, yeah, so, and so what he basically, I mean, and it wasn't just Einstein, it happened several times. Yeah. First there was the view, again, that the Earth was Flat. Then it was round, but the Earth was at the center of the universe, yeah, right, and yeah. there were Ptolemy, fixed Ptolemaic yeah, shells. Yeah, yeah. right, and then there was uh, Kepler, Copernicus, mm -hmm. Galileo. Yeah. And so, what we've learned, and what I, what we should have learned, especially scientists, is that facts are more like opinions that change very slowly, uh, because the we way reify things that we're used to. Yes, and we build them like into that. our architecture and all our that thought patterns and so forth. Yeah, that's right. So it, the it, way we bi think, biological okay. evolution does that. It seems to me biological evolution, but we're we're a little different because um, we're unique. Yeah, we're different in that a lot of our <laughs> behavior, especially our cognitive behavior, yeah. the structure is yes genetically expressed, mm -hmm. and there are certain uh, there are certain pre-expressed structures like the facility for language and. Mm -hmm. uh, the way we mm -hmm. our our, vi our visual cortex has cells that detect uh, lines, <coughs> motion. You know, very spe specialized for evolution mm -hmm. by evolution. But our brain is self-modifying, right? It modifies itself by active participation in in, uh, in paying attention and experience and perception. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. this is. This makes us quite different. Yeah, uh, you you came onto this by having uh, gone to university and study. I hear you say Connecticut University. Well, you university got, Connecticut. Well, uh, are you autodidactic? You know the term is where you have been interested in things and running things down uh, individually much. to understand things in a way much, rather yeah. than being locked into a particular academic discipline. That's pretty much me. Yes. Okay, that's good. I think yeah, I think that's okay. where the future of intellectual concern is going to be, rather than in the all the various canons and paradigms that are specialized. I think I th And I agree specialization with this, is confused with scholarship entirely too much in the yes, academic, I certainly in yes. academia. Yeah. I agree with this. Mm. I absolutely agree with this. Mm. And I, th I think that that is the case, and we're seeing evidence for it now mm. at all of the universities, not all, but many of the, of the most significant universities, all of these multi multidisciplinary groups are right. forming yeah. uh, because uh, scholars are starting to realize that it, it's like it's like a preconciliance. Okay. Uh, um, okay, they're yeah. starting to understand mm -hmm. that they can contribute to each other to a common understanding. That might be something out of the economic model too, to where you get uh, you get you know specialization is equated with scholarship and particularly linear regression with the computer when it came. You could become highly interested and very fully informed on one particular dot within a pointless painting and go into great detail about that and become the world's expert on that. Metaphor. And if it's scarce and so forth, it's got economic value, you can get it with the grants and so forth. So there might have been that. Rather than the systems thinking of the paradigm setters and the big systems thinkers like uh, Einstein or others who think that way. And yet, uh -huh. and yet, and yet, uh, even the paradigm 
shifters mm -hmm. uh, can be limited by their Kuhnian assumptions, which mm -hmm. are unspoken oftentimes to yeah. ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for example, um, Einstein yeah. uh, famously uh, would not accept or could not, depending on how you interpret it, uh, two, fat, two things that we know to be the case at the quantum level. Mm -hmm. uh, quantum entanglement, mm -hmm. uh, where two particles, uh, when they are entangled, that's a very specific process of mm -hmm. correlation. But once that happens, they're like, two, they're like the same particle. So okay. you can separate two entangled particles by a dis any arbitrary distance. Mm -hmm. um, say they're hundreds of light years apart. Mm -hmm. If you change the spin mm -hmm. on one, mm -hmm. the quantum property of spin, mm -hmm. the other one changes immediately. Really? Yeah. And there's no information transmission. They're one like particle. Like morphic resonance, the Sheldrake. It, I don't know it, if you're it, Rupert Sheldrake. Yeah. Uh, it's, no. it, it's, mm. not, it's Oh. Similar, except that they really are like one particle. This okay. is the thing. Even though, Even though they're separated. By vast difference. Yes. Okay. So that's one. Uh, he that's he, he called me, it spooky yeah. action at a distance. Spooky action. Actually, that's what Einstein, Einstein called, used called the that. term spooky? spooky action at a distance. That sounds like a Hollywood yeah. term. You know. And uh, he huh? wouldn't accept it, and he spent many years trying to c come up with an alternative well, he was theory coming up unified called lo field theory, lo local variables. Local that variables. That he felt there were hidden local variables okay. that would explain entanglement without. It's spookiness. And, and the that entanglement was fit into the mathematics or whatever, quantum Qu mechanics? Absolutely. Well, because absolutely, he was yeah. a unified field, a but reaching was, for a unified he, field. Uh, but he had trouble also with uh, quantum uncertainty, the Heisenberg okay. principle. Heisenberg, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. uh, he said God does not play dice with the universe. That's right. He did, among a lot right. of other good so, things he said. Yeah, he yeah. said a lot of great yeah, things. He said a lot of good <laughs> things. And also, he was informed, that woman I mentioned to you, her grandfather was Ernst Mach. Oh, and Ernst course, Mach yeah. informed him mightily Einstein as he was growing up. And so he was a precursor to that. That's, it builds on what we know. And what's happening now is we're coming to know so much so quickly over the true. long haul of human experience. This so is true. It's really an explosion of consilience. Consilience, can it be associated like the person I particularly like is Fuller, Buckminster Fuller, a comprehensivist. And he would refer to the center, he would refer to, he wrote his books, his two big mag magnus opus uh, was synergetic. So he'd use the term synergy, behavioral systems unpredicted by the sum of the parts. Something yeah, that, more remember, than the sum of the parts. Yeah, the, something, the, the whole, that was sort uh, the, of like the gestalt, synergetic. The gestalt, there was a yeah. synergetic geometry that he built his thinking and philosophizing upon. Different than consilience? Well, the, that's a little bit, yeah. Mm. Uh, the, that was, the, you know, gestalt theory mm. and, gestalt, and all yeah. of that. And that's been, that kind of has transformed, in my view, in some way into the, uh, the focus, especially at the Santa Fe Institute, well, uh, uh, on complexity theory, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, where uh, and the focus is on something that's called uh, emergence, okay. uh, and, uh, and there are chaotic boundaries. Chaotic. Uh, yeah. Remember, there was chaos theory where yeah, there was a discontinuity. Right. right. Well, th that's been uh, expanded into a, the, a mathematical body of work, which is very early, and there's no proof of this. It's right. another highly debated area. Yeah. Biologists sometimes feel that. <clears throat> Uh, complexity theory is what they've been doing all along. Yeah, <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, uh, yeah. But it's basically that uh, it states that um, a cr that the uh, there are certain properties across a on the other side of a chaotic boundary mm -hmm. that are not predictable by oh, the properties of, of uh, the entity on this side. I'll give you an example. By the sum of the parts. Uh, Something or e anything uh, about the synergy uh, uh, behavior system unpredicted by the sum mm. of the parts. It's, it's Maximally it's, engaged, you could say, if you bring right. in temporal development and evolution. It's very similar to that. I'll okay. give you an example. Yeah. I'll give you a couple of good examples. Mm. Uh, one is the uh, the properties of water when it changes phase. Yeah. Steam. Steam. Liquid. Liquid. Ice. Yeah. yeah. Um, at this point, now this may change when we understand more about the interaction of lower levels of scale mm -hmm. and their role in molecular, mm -hmm. uh, molecular uh, thermodynamics and some, and some other things. I but to ask but you let me finish. I just want to finish this one point, though, okay. if I might. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is that the everything we know about water, mm -hmm. no matter what we know now about water, the the atomic constituents, the molecular structure does not allow us to predict the, the nature of its behavior during phase change. Phase change? Yeah, you know, when it goes from ice to liquid to... Oh. That is not predictable by looking just at the water molecule itself. So okay. that's an example of a property that emerges. Emerges out of a context. Yes, yeah. like that. And there uh -huh. are some others. Yeah, there are some others Vari as well. that's another variable. 
Yeah. Like this. Yeah. Uh, the behavior of birds and fish when they move in schools. Amazing how they can, yeah, And that right. is also not predictable by studying just one bird or fish. Right. Well, now, that, that may change later when right. we get to understand their neural structures. Uh -huh. Yeah. So right now, it's, it's a work in progress. Yeah, these things can emerge out of a synergistic uh, uh, interfacing. It's like a pointless painting. You get one dot, you can concentrate on the purple, but you back off and you see the pattern. And when you see that, and that's what you're engaged in, is trying to see the patterns between that's a lot of different it, integrated really is, yeah. systems, including, uh, a, I don't know, we finally get to, I don't know what you think of Lovelock and that, and Gaia, and the idea of seeing the Earth as an organism. Or I would mention also string theory, uh, Brian Greene and that, and also Kaku had a hand in that, where the mathematics of that seems to indicate, uh, if I may, if I understand it as a layman and everything, uh, the mathematics is very beautiful, and what they're saying is there are uh, 10, 12 dimensions, and that uh, the mathematics seems to indicate, let's say, for our thinking, that this universe, 13.8 billion years ago, our Big Bang occurred, and everything, that this universe might be part of parallel universes that exist, and that they're connected by wormholes, which brings us down to whether is this or is this not a closed system. And if it's a closed system, does the second law of thermodynamics, that all systems move toward chaos to the limits of the system, real, apply within a closed system? Is it perhaps not a closed system? Uh, because of string theory, what they're introducing into normal physics and so forth. And then also, if I could, Fuller used to cast about. I don't know if you've read much Fuller, but Fuller is mm. my main man. I think I think he's the best ever. But he 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 said he used to cast about for is there any purpose to let's say mm. evolution or human evolution or human development? And he used to postulate that there is um, an anti-entropic function. He called it he called it synergetic or syntropic. That the whole biological evolutionary planet uh, development on this third planet of this solar system. I don't even think they knew from string theory at the time when he was writing before no. he passed and everything. But well. it, it, but there was a whole movement, an anti, uh, the evolutionary process. What three uh, point eight billion years when evolution began or something was to move across entropy and bring increased conscious pattern to the process of which we are a part, being culminated sure. at mankind gave some purpose to human, uh, human purpose in universe. Mm -hmm. And all of that, and does the second law of thermodynamics uh, hold, or is there something that isn't that 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 doesn't? And if not, how do we get our sense of purpose within this universe where we have a self-reflective consciousness and all the neurotransmitters and the understanding of the way the brain works and all these specializations we have now? How do we deal with the bigger issue of what's it all about, Alfie? Well, you have um, it, it's the Alfie part that's. The <laughs> 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 um, um, okay, well, th there are a lot of questions in that very interesting statement you just made. Uh, so I'll, I'll unpack it a little bit. Okay, good, by all means. Um, firstly, <clears throat> uh, in terms of st string theory, we yeah. know, first of all, it wasn't always beautiful. Mm -hmm. Ed Witten at Princeton You're right. integrated Witten those was, five yeah. versions into one and made it quite beautiful. Uh, he's responsible for M theory, the you know, and, and so on. Right, absolutely. And all of that. Yeah, that's true. Um, but what all of them will admit, mm -hmm. publicly or otherwise, mm -hmm. is that it's a mathematical story. Yeah, it's mathematical. It's a, it's, it's but, mathematic. it's, but it's a story. It, we, we don't have the technology yet to see if it conforms they can't even to get physical the, reality They or can't not. even get the CERN accelerator going to get it some sort of well, a no, it, 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 it's, it's, well, it's going to work. I think it's going to work. Yeah, it's doing pretty well. And when yeah. it goes up to 14 uh, gig electron volts, we may, in fact, uh, be at the point where we can find if, out if there is a Higgs boson and Higgs field Yeah, or not. that's what they're looking for, uh, boson, Yeah, because yeah. that's the Higgs field. You see, every particle has an associated field. So yeah. if there's a Higgs boson, that means there's a Higgs field. It's a hard uh, sell in the a, world of uh, commercial. Well, the thing is about the Higgs field yeah. is that that's what gives that's what enables particles to have mass. Yeah, yeah. So if yeah. there is no Higgs boson, then something's wrong with the standard model of physics. And yeah, that's what all that's, that's right. About. That's what it's that's about. What that's about. right. And they're trying to reach but for it. But and, and then yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Spell but it out. Yeah. yeah. Um, I knew it was going to be like this. No, no, no. This is like, great. No, this is, this like, is so it's exciting. Like, uh, yeah. It's like uh, that's that's something they have. They have the Wilkinson array of telescopes. I mean, this back against this thing of taking the measure of things. Mm. It's pretty interesting that we have like unlike a crocodile or something. Something, we're able to take the measure of things with our extended consciousness and technology and so forth. And we've got a picture of the Big Bang 
uh, that occurred uh, within about 200,000 years of its occurrence, 13.8 billion years ago, from the Wilkinson Array. Michio Kaku tells us that when they get the picture of the shock wave uh, from the CERN, and from that, and it's got an array, LISA, it's about to come online now, they're going to get a picture of the Big Bang occurring 13.8 billion years ago within a nanosecond of its occurrence. That's a pretty good measure of taking the measure of, uh, uh, measure of things by intelligent capability to understand what's it all about. That would be Stewart. that would be <laughs> that would really be something. I agree. That's a very exciting possibility, and and yet at the same time, um, those uh, by the way those tunnels you mentioned those yeah, wormholes warm they're called yeah, yeah they're called uh, I, they're, they're also called uh, Einstein Rosen uh, bridges. Are they? I've not yeah. known that. I've not heard. Um, that. But that's just an holes. aside. Yeah. Uh, so the thing that's really and interesting you got black is that holes and white holes. We have no white holes in our. Well, universe. yeah, that's yeah, the, yeah, yeah uh, the, you know the, there were. All, Earlier discussions that, in fact, um, that the that the what's called the Big Bang was just the opening of a white hole. Yeah, right. You know, and that whole kind of thing. Um, this is all very interesting. But what's to me, what's really interesting is that, uh, and this is hard to, to, to because we, we are creatures of time and space. Mm -hmm. So we think in terms of uh, of finite distances of of passage of time. Right, right. Time and space itself, as we understand it, yeah. did not exist before what we call the Big Bang. Apparently. We, right? So therefore, there is no before Fuller, as Fuller, such. Fuller would say, Fuller would say, the universe, everything parallel or other, is synergetic. There are behaviors or knowledges of things that even if we get to a point, let's say, of uh, Avoiding entropy and blowing it up into some ac ac atomic god or ramadung or something, but we liberate, let's say, the whole system to where everything's operating. Everybody's operating within a context here, the end of times, so where we get a, a synergistic resonancy that'll interaccommodate us to universe well, at a level yeah. transcendent to what we've been over two hundred thousand years of human experience. But that would even be nested within an a priori acceptance of there being synergistic resonances beyond that which we will become as we emerge in a punctuated equilibrium sense from 200,000 years of human evolution. Well, We're well, coming well to the put. end of time. Well put. Uh, well put. And I, I will say also that um, in terms of, just to get back to string theory, a couple mm. of interesting things is that, for example, there was a, a, a couple of months ago, uh, there were at the American Museum of Natural History, there was an event, and Brian Green was asked, um, mm -hmm. uh, well, do you believe in string theory? Yeah. And he said no. Yeah. He said no. Interesting. Um, because he knows that, that it's necessary uh, to have conformance to some degree, at least yeah. testable conformance with physical reality. And, yeah. we, and again, we can't do yeah. that yet. Yeah, you're right. We right. can't do that yet. Uh, then there are some other very interesting things as well about the relationship between um, space, time, gravity. There are other ways of approaching it uh, beyond just string theory. There's the, there are various other. There's something called quantum loop gravity. Right. There are other theories that uh, they all have the thing in common. They they all have is the attempt to integrate gravity mm -hmm. uh, with the other. Forces. Yeah, they've had trouble with the, it. The string the theory apparently uh, claims to be able to handle that. It does. There are it others is that beautiful it mathematically, as well. beautifully mathematically, as I understand. Um, it's it's not quite as beautiful and elegant as uh, some of the, th for example, the way that even though the e equals mc squared is that's very, very that's simplistic. That's mm -hmm. not actually the his equation. It's mm -hmm. a simplified version. But yeah. nonetheless, the fact that so much can be represented by so little. Mm -hmm. is very elegant and beautiful. Yeah. String theory is still a bit onerous. Mm. Uh, it's just better than it was, thanks to Ed Witten. Yeah, I think yeah. Ed Witten, you're right. That's right. He yeah. had, Was he at the advanced study, I guess? Yeah, Princeton. Uh, Princeton. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. really good. Well, what it gets back again in human purpose and so on. How does it integrate? Do you integrate over into things? You could go in great detail about uh, your neuro, neuro... Like, we didn't know, if I'm not mistaken, we didn't know... 30 years ago, 35 years ago, that there were in the brain, I don't want to talk about the mind, but brain, neurotransmitters. I don't think that we knew they existed. They, they discovered the first thing was acetylcholine, and that there's a, there's a neurotransmitter at the synaptic cleft between the axions of the 10th to the 10th power neurons that make up a human right. brain. We didn't know. And what That's I'm saying is 200,000 years. 
That's 10,000 generations. And what's happening now is we're coming to where we're having uh, like some sort of a, of, a, of a really significant, not only paradigm, paradigm, a paradigm of punctuated, comparable in our lifetime. Perhaps. Possibly, yeah. Uh, possibly. Where it's coming in at such dimensions, every day comes a revolution over the transom from all these fields, and it's coming into a point of some sort of a qualitative transformation uh, because our knowledge of things is becoming so rapid, and the extension of capability is becoming so momentous in terms of larger systems. So it's something like an evolution they call punctuated equilibrium, yeah, right. where the new appears. Does right. that relate to consilience, or does that relate to Edwin Wilson, or does it relate to some of these issues of the time in which we live that most people are concerned with when they think about things? If you if you understand what I mean, I do. I, I, do, I do understand what you mean. And I will Isaac Asimov the said, "This is the defining generation right. in the evolutionary mm -hmm. process," which is a pretty big statement against 13.8 billion years of a universe Well, we shall existing. see. Um, I will point out a, a couple of things in answer to that. Mm. Um, it's a very good question and a good observation, I think. Um, firstly, there is, in terms of <coughs> um, the synapse, here's a good example. Mm. Um, you had read that post I did on exocortical. I did. It was right? really interesting uh, to me. So yeah. it turns out. Really good. I did, That's the top well, well, on your you. blog now. Yeah, it's the first one. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a top Go one to now. that by all means, yeah. Thank you. No, it was very good. Um, very well done, yeah. Um, but uh, be, I've since then, since and that was very recent. Uh -huh. uh, uh, there's some new research in three areas that I'd like to tell that you. About. You only did that about three days ago. Yeah, so, so I, things so, are moving so fast. very quickly. So uh, <laughs> it, that that acceleration yeah. of discovery yeah, and yeah, innovation, yeah, yeah. you know, is addressed. Uh, Verna Vinja, actually a mathematician and a science fiction writer, mm. came up with the term originally the singularity as it applies to discontinuous yeah. change. Yeah, but Kurzweil really Kurzweil's took it to it the now, max, yeah. and you yeah. know, but. There are three things, and this is very interesting because you mentioned synapse, the, the synapse in our brain. Yeah, um, axons, yeah. Yeah, the axons. It the, makes it, a system. Yeah. yeah I, and they yeah. vary. I don't know how many there are now. Neurotransmitters. What are they? It, 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 acetylcholine was first. Well, there's, there's, there's dopamine. There's serotonin. And serotonin there's and, and quite all a few, these things. Yeah, and that is sure. the state of consciousness that is characteristic of a person's state of mind is the relationship of... Uh, of neurotransmitters and uptake within the axons between the there's, neurons of the and there's brain. There's a lot. There's a lot more than that too. I'm uh, sure it's more. Yeah, there are, there are. Uh, my, for example, Stuart Hameroff at uh, University of Arizona is focused. Has been. I know know him for 25 years. He, I met him in Japan when I was there. Okay. Uh, and he focuses on the microtubular cytoskeleton within each neuron. Uh, it was, you know, the common knowledge or the common wisdom was that was just an infrastructure that gave like a kind of a, a shape and rigidity of some sort. Mm -hmm. But there's processing going on there, and he, his, it's his view. It's very controversial that it's a kind of quantum, um, a quantum level that gives rise to our consciousness. So that's that's him, and how he looks at that. Mm -hmm. But I, I did want to mention that uh, three things happened within very almost the same day, almost. These last three days uh, since you Well, no, I became aware of them. Oh, they, in know, these last was, three days? You know, yeah. In the, in the well, report days. to the world, I'm telling young you, man. <laughs> I'm telling you. Okay, so one at, uh, at, uh, at um, Oregon State, mm -hmm. uh, researchers have developed what they're calling microbeads of iron oxide, rust, you know, just very mm -hmm. na little nanostructures of rust that can be used to, uh, they're very sensitive to, chemical, to chemicals. So they, they make it, Possible, and they give, and, and it can be magnetically determined if there's a certain chemical in the body or in the, in the area. So just hold that one okay. right there. Yeah. Second one uh, is um, at the uh, University of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. um, a single electron transistor has been developed, which is pretty much is pretty small, right? And yeah. so that is yeah. their intention. But for example, the the uh, the, the nano beads are just uh, magnetic nano beads mm -hmm. are uh, looking at medical applications. Okay. Right. The uh, uh, the work on the single electron transistor is focused on quantum computing, okay. and then the last one at the uh, University of Southern California, um, uh, a a carbon nanotube, speaking of Fuller, mm -hmm. you know, the carbon nanotube Buck based. Buckminster Fullerene. Yes. Carbon 60. E exactly. So uh, that is, they have developed, based on carbon nanotubes, a synthetic 
neuron with a functional synapse. Okay. So if you take those three things and yeah. you combine, and this is the yeah, that's what you do. You can yeah. And right. then the futurist part yeah. is that I look what I look at what that could mean. So what do you come up with as a thing? There are, there are different combinations. You can yeah. take the the uh, single electron uh -huh. uh, transistor, mm -hmm. and you can take the work uh, on the uh, synthetic synapse. Mm -hmm. And if you, uh, and they may or may not even be aware of each other, right. but you could see that the, if they converge, mm -hmm. the possibility of a, uh, a single, because this is not a, a chip, a, a device that works like other transistors. Right, it's right. hardware, emul it's not even emulation, it's a hardware neuron. Moving toward molecular right. computing? So, so, so something like that. So yeah. that you could see these devices converging and you have a single transistor synthetic neuron. Yeah. So which, pro which would then suggest the possibility of a highly dense, low power, very effective or synthetic neocortex, you uh -huh. know, at some point in the future. Okay. So then, yeah. okay, so you take that. Mm -hmm. Then you can, uh, you take the nanobeads mm -hmm. that determine chemical concentrations. Nanobeads or nanotubes? You know, no, no, this is the other one in, uh, in Oregon. Oh, okay. The nat magnetic nanobeads yeah. for detecting Beads. chemicals. Mm -hmm. They call them nanobeads. That's okay, of, okay. Uh, and so that could be, you could look at that in combination with the other two developments and see the uh, development over time of an artificial, say, sense of smell mm -hmm. based on these devices. Mm -hmm. We already know that we can have photo uh, photon detection. Okay, yeah. So you could, you right. and if you really mm. push the limit on this, mm -hmm. you could see how this is the very, could we looked at from the future as mm -hmm. the very beginnings of the early stages of work that led to a functional uh, human like Android, for example, right, mm -hmm. with different uh, <clears throat> quantum-based computational devices that function in a manner that's analogous to our biology. Okay. You know, so that kind yeah. of thing is very, it's very interesting to me. That's what I like to find these different areas that may not be aware of each other, see wh how they might combine and recombine, right. and how that might lead to something new in the future. Okay, that's good. That, well, I, I, I can tie that in with the synergistic thinking. You've got, I think so, you've yeah, got that's why I brought unpredictability it up. Unpredictability within the context itself, you have, when you have a combined, you have a combined, you have something more than the sum of the parts. Like, it's something very much like that. Yeah, And yeah. new things yeah. emerge. Yeah. You know, there's a convergence, and then something new emerges. Mm -hmm. and uh, how do we put all of that in time, in terms of the human condition, keeping it grounded in terms of human consciousness, the political context, all the context of everything, it's all interconnected. Uh, how do we put that all together in terms of uh, time, and where we stand in terms of uh, this general proposition, taking a lot of these things into account, some on faith, some on projection of what might be and everything. Uh, in a biological process, you're in a, I said last night to you something about the womb, you said it might be more like the birth canal. And the idea that we're at a point from within the womb, if you're coming into a new way of being, an entity, an organism or something, you cannot know what it is outside of that. You can project, or I don't know if you can, but you can't know that. You're coming to a new relationship uh, that is, uh, you're, gonna, you're going to be born into a new condition. You don't know that. In species terms, you get into biology and a lot of the quantum mechanics and physics and all this kind of thing of understanding, that we're coming to a time, do you sense or do you sense from everything? And if you get into art and these kind of things, that we're coming to a time of qualitative transformation that could be roughly, let's be geopolitical, roughly translated out into liberation a real, um, let's see, two, three quarters of the world population now have cell phones that can be good, very transparent. I mean, uh, the trends in terms of the economic, uh, geopolitical context are totally inadequate. The future requires, in terms of what we would call roughly, a liberated humanity where each cell in the organism is, I think it's 100 trillion cells of the human organism. They all matter, they all count, they're all part of a system that each cell of the human society, we're heading for 10 billion, is let's say just in a certain sense, maximally engaged and liberated rather than being in a condition of just uh, just a truncated capability being able to be realized and so forth. That we're getting to a point of a qualitative transformation comparable to uh, what would be roughly called in the wisdom schools and so forth, liberation that we've been within a context of quality uh, that is going to be qualitatively transformed and that there will be a resonancy like an orchestra hitting high C or something 
uh, that will inter-accommodate us to universe in a species sense, that this is all adding up to a qualitative transformation in evolution of consciousness itself, and how will we give name to the new birth of the consciousness relationship? We have to uh, universal mind or its extensions or its projections and so forth uh, in a future tense. No, that may be actually the waters break and we're about to do it, leave. And that's why there's a lot of anxiety, even as we realize that we could very well be stillborn at our own hand by setting off the atomic weapons, by reifying outdated institutions rather than accepting. And why are political leaders never able to address the idea? We may be at a time of qualitative transformation that all the science and consilient thinking would indicate. And why is it never mentioned in the news or anywhere? So, Andrews, your, your, your questions are profound and complex. So, what are you um, trying to get to patterns? Yeah. So, for, they have so, meaning so, to people. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, one thing that um, occurred to me while, while you were you know, talking about that, rambling, is, on. is that no, not really. Mm. Uh, uh, is that I'd like to tie, t tie in uh, some of the things we've talked about. For example, mm. um, we talked about you talked about anti. And, uh, Entropic systems. I, you know, I refer to them as negentropic, but it's well. He called them, uh, if I may. But Fuller came to call. He's an anti-entropic. Yes. Moved across to entropy right. Right. and brought increased pattern. He came in, in the end to call it syntropic, which would be a combination of synergistic, uh, anti-entropic, which would be a resonancy by which we would relate to the broader universe in an intellectual sense. One could project. Well, what so so, it, so or, that's said species for a level. Okay, so that's said for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Um, I've long had the view that uh, the, that biological systems yes, uh -huh. are negentropic in the sense that in, in a semi-closed system they do create order. They take in energy and create the, order. Is it closed right. or open? That's the question uh, the string theory raises in terms of uh, both quantum mechanics. Well, there, there and are there are difficulties when we're talking about entropy and uh, anti-entropism. Right. But I heard you mention a uh, uh, second law of thermo or yeah. thermodynamics itself yeah. because everything is a gradient. I mean, so yes. So the thing is, though, mm -hmm. that uh, that there's also we've, we've talked about three things that are yeah. relevant here. Yeah. We've talked about uh, negentropy yeah. or anti-entropism. We've talked about levels of scale, mm -hmm. and we've talked about. Does that bring in time? Levels of scale in a uh, moment. In, in, in time. In okay. a moment. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about uh, emergence. Okay. Yeah. Uh, over chaotic boundaries. Now these are all related in the way I right. I look yeah. at things. I can uh, see because yeah because yeah. as uh, mm -hmm. We create order. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's a discontinuity at some point. Yeah. What you referred to a, a little while ago as punctuated equilibrium. That's what they right. call it in evolution. So that's gold so that's and a discon eldritch, dis yeah. a, a discontinuity mm -hmm. uh, on the other, uh, right. and it forms a chaotic boundary because of discontinuity. Mm -hmm. On the other side, there's an emergence at a higher order of complexity. That's right. That's right. right? So that's how I see these things fitting yeah. together. And, and so to answer that with that yeah. framework, mm -hmm. that's a, what the framework I would use to answer your question. Mm -hmm. Um, because it involves levels of, of scale, because all members of a given species don't evolve in lockstep. No, right? no. Uh, there's mutations that are favorable, that are mm. not favorable. Yeah, right. mm. uh, so it's, it's, it gets into an area that's probabilistic. For example, I look at the things we're talking about, yeah. artificial intelligence, transhumanism, uh, Transhumanism, the, like the, the, yeah, that's the ability to program our genes to make Changes affecting health, affecting longevity, right. whatever it might be. Right, right. right. Uh, intelligence. Th it's very easy for me to come up with opposing futures. Yeah. Oh, one yeah. would be uh, one would be very uh, uh, utopian. One would be dystopian. Well, right. we can it's do just, that it's, now it's, in a yeah, way that the that the geopolitical realities can be spelled out to us, particularly through just looking at it in terms of weapon systems, which have yeah. led the research, still do. Geopolitical thinking right. based upon it would be called zero sum yes, or you know right. zero sum. Or Richard Wright wrote or Robert Wright wrote that good book non zero sum. It's really good. It's where right. if, if for me to win you have to lose and that's all why of, I brought and it that's up. what all of our that's institutions exactly where I brought it up. All of our institutions the other night. Right. Uh, well, all yeah. our institutions were predicated and that's that right. it's assumed to be human nature. One of the Mr. Greenspan will come on and say, human nature, you're, everybody's inherently by the structure of the universe and parallel universe, greedy. So that you have to, and you have the, you're going to have yeah. another, you know, all of these I, kind I of things where they projected. I, uh, I, I, let's say it this way. I say they're that reifying outdated yeah. institutions. 
it's that not is just understandable, that. It's and we that. do have to anchor to history, but we can't be. You had something about prologue yeah. and history. Yeah, what that, is the term that in you fact, use? because our brain modifies itself, yeah. we have the capability mm -hmm. to reject the necessity of past as prologue. Pa the past is pro right. It doesn't have to we be have the a capability case to reject it. We've not had the capability to do it in a liberated context, except until about the year 1970 by the modeling. Oh, you were so you were talking about that the yeah. other night. Yeah, no, right? I think that's yeah. serious. It w w if you take the one side, the modeling that shows destructive uh, uh, of the species, Krakatoa. They had crack. Did I mention that to you earlier? Not the other night. The other program. I mentioned it with the other guy. Krakatoa. They had it on last night. The biggest destruction of anything yeah, natural in history. Yeah. 300,000 yeah. 300, were killed or 38,000 or something. But it wasn't species lethal. There's modeling that can show. And it should be made public knowledge. It should be discussed that uh, the weapons systems and the geopolitical projection of power and empire imperialism and all the rest of it that's going on, that the weapons, if they're to be unleashed, wild abandon like they've been throughout all of human history, mm. it, are, it, it wipes out the entire evolutionary process of consciousness of which we are a part. That's existentially new. Yeah, this is And it didn't bad. occur even in 62. If I may, in 62, when we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, it would be the end of civilization. But it wouldn't have been, there would have been a few straggling survivors in New Guinea or something to carry on. Do you understand? Yeah, it's course, an existential new. So then the existential new on a positive side, this is a popular level of thinking and so forth. It could be understood by people. At that level, that's one thing. And on the other side, what would be equally, what would be equally uh, existentially significant on the living re side? Bucket Fuller used to talk about living re. One premise is we have transcended at the level of capability material scarcity. Well, we, we have the ability that's that's to right. provide for everybody of the human society a way that would liberate them within an ecological context that has not been characteristic of human history and it's never mentioned. It's mentioned in some Where? circles. We Where? Talk, well, Nobody, our, you our never see it in the news. It. You don't see the president. Um, you don't see the leaders. You don't see the business there leaders. Are two you levels don't see to any it. intellectual. I'll, Intellectuals are falling so down I'm on the job. I'm going to address this now. I'll address okay. this now. There are two we ways to address this. we got a couple this. minutes left. Okay, well, I'll make it quick. Mm -hmm. There are two levels. There are two ways to address this. One is in the political or geopolitical sense, mm -hmm. which leads towards, to, it seems like it's leading towards a dystopic future. Um, Not necessarily, no. May, That's one possibility. one possibility. The other possibility is liberation. So this is what I'm going to address now. Not they're, constrained they're, by uh, the... But how yeah. does that liberation come about? There are two technologies I mentioned the other night. Yeah. It's good to bring them up here. Yeah, okay, good. One is Bussard fusion or Polywell fusion mm -hmm. developed in Canada mm -hmm. uh, where it's a very small compact fusion reactor, not very expensive. Mm -hmm. It could lead to, you know, a, a fusion reactor in every home. More, you know, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. A, if okay. we get to fusion, right. I've been hearing that right. for 40 well, years. Every day, it's five years right. away, we're going to well, have fusion. because the fusion that's discussed mm -hmm. are large-scale tokamak and ITER reactors. Yeah, right. Very expensive, very, uh, use a lot of power. This is a very different model. And what I can do is, by the way, I have one more thing I want to add, but I can post some of these things on my blog so do. people can find out more about this. If they want to go there, I'll do that. That's what, I, yeah. that's what life's and, about. So, And then the second thing, um, that can lead to a post-scarcity economy. I'm uh, proposing the that we're there. No, it's not that we have to get somewhere. It, we are there at the level of capability, the and we have to have something that uh, I see what you're that is dealing with the capability in real terms, both killing re, make it public, make it known, make it known that these things they're doing have a certain consequence reified to history, and then make it known we have this capability so you have a context for systems thinking of the whole thing, an operating manual for Spaceship Earth to know the dimensions rather than fussing around with what maybe if we do this it might and we're still limping along and uh, uh, do you understand? Of course, what I'm, of course it should be voiced. Talking. And it should be made public, and it could be understood we're, by everybody. We're doing it now. Well, no, we're trying, but <laughs> nobody is doing it. They don't talk. Well, nobody. A, there are a lot. Where are the systems? That's another hour thinker. discussion we could have. Well, right? we should. We because don't have an hour. We only no, have we three don't. minutes. You have to get it in in haiku. So I'm going to get it in very quickly. Okay. The second part of it is the other thing I mentioned the other night, which um, is nano. Uh, personal yeah. nano factories okay. that use uh, uh, basically carbon derivative molecules yeah. to print literally anything. Yeah. Yeah. So if you take pers personal fusion power, 
you're off the everyone's off the grid. Yeah. You take a printer that could print everything from food to clothes to anything, mm -hmm. including other printers mm -hmm. and other fusion reactors. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is very far future. But the point is that both of these, the fusion reactor that I'm talking about, Polywell Fusion, mm -hmm. is actually been funded by, for about thirteen million dollars by the Obama administration to come up with a prototype in just a few years. Well, the thirteen million dollars is it, nothing for this type of yeah. fusion. Mm -hmm. It's enough for a prototype. Okay. That's the, okay. That's yeah. How okay. Much Go for those is. things. Yeah. And then the other yeah. thing, uh, there are very early prototypes types of these nano factories mm -hmm. that do very basic things based on uh, you know petrochemical and carbon derivatives mm -hmm. so it's not just science fiction anymore so okay, what it's not so take and it, out a haiku but right. what's needed to be aligned mm -hmm. for the betterment of all mankind and the ecology I'm trying to make it a real haiku though no okay so, okay, so okay. Do, is, do not it's, tell it's, me it's, I'm it's, source it's, of your <laughs> knockout <laughs> um, mm -hmm. is the integration of those tech is those technologies plus a shift in understanding that affects the overall political will. Thank you. That would be very good. The political will is based on the uh, ironclad laws of, uh, of, of zero, uh, sum. zero sum. Absolutely. And that's where everybody's talking. We, we that's where everybody, and so we got all these ideas. We can't do it because we can't afford it. We've got to blow it all up. It's, it's such a, and that's where the well, we conundrum is. And it's got to get... We, I know. We have and to it's cut got, public services. It's all got, of that stuff. It's got to get now not only to the liberating of the masses of the people. They're like serfs on a feudal estate and everything like that. That's right. Masses within an ecological Content. And the biggest trick of all is something that can be understood by the keepers of the canon of the historical oh. li linking, but they can't be running the show in the way that they have out of history because history is a nightmare from which we're attempting to awaken. We need an alarm clock and we need some people can awaken us to the overall view of the reality at a level of capability and the intellectual communities falling down well, on the good. job. They're all going into their little thing and talking maybe in a hundred years we'll be able That's to. Right. You and, know. and the cap and on your all of it. site is really good because you Thank bring you. those things together in a way that's really relevant to real intellectual integrity. And the danger that you've just summarized mm -hmm. can be summarized further into oh. saying that what we're living in now increasingly is a world where nothing has value unless it's monetizable. That's right. That's and right. That is it's economic. An inherently self-destructive problem. Now, could you give me in thirty seconds how we're going to set up the world economic order? No, I'm sorry. That's not fair. The economic, it has to be blended in. We need an economic. How are you going to deal with the economic? The way, I, the way I look sum? at this is, a very, is, is also a different discussion because I don't think a political uh, situation like we have can be addressed politically. I think it has to do with people, the kind of thing we're understanding about, understanding why we think as we do, why mm. we act as we do, understanding what's driving us, that we have the ability to be yeah. to be free of our biological imperatives. Right. And those things are not supposed to be the realm of the politician or the businessman. You don't blame a lion for eating an antelope. It's the business of the intellectual community, and the intellectual community is bought off the paradigms are set, the peer review is set, and it's bought off by the political economic interests, and that's something that we've got to learn to address. We and it's the intellectuals that are falling down on the job. I agree with this. We okay, should have another talk. You. We have to have more talk. Your thank pleasure. You so much. The thank you so much. Stuart Mason, Dan Brot. Thank you. Uh, intellectual, uh, his site is really good to say it again. That's something where people can go. Yes. Um, critical thought. One, string, one, one long string. Criticalthought.co. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. Critical thought. Dot co. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Okay.